This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 46. Coming up on Space Time. The largest comet ever seen. Detection of the most distant galactic laser. And China launches its 182nd spy satellite since 2016. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope has discovered the largest comet ever seen, a 130-kilometre-wide monster 50 times bigger than most known comets. Astronomers say this giant icy space rock would most likely have a mass somewhere around 500 trillion tonnes. And that's a staggering 100,000 times greater than the mass of a typical comet found in our part of the solar system. This behemoth comet, named C-2014 UN271 Bernardinelli Bernstein, is barreling towards us at some 36,000 kilometres per hour. But don't worry, it's not coming any closer than about 1.6 billion kilometres of the Earth, which is slightly further away than the orbit of Saturn, and even that close approach won't be for another nine years. One of the study's authors, David Jewett from the University of California, Los Angeles, says the comet is literally the tip of an iceberg for many thousands of comets that are simply too faint to see in the more distant parts of our solar system. Astronomers have always suspected that this comet had to be big because it was so bright even at such a large distance. But now, thanks to Hubble, they've been able to confirm it. The previous record holder was the comet 2002 VQ-94. It had a nucleus estimated to be about 100 kilometres across. It was discovered in 2002 by Liner, the Lincoln Near-Earth Asteroid Research Project. Comet C-2014 UN-271 was discovered by astronomers Pedro Bernardinelli and Gary Bernstein in archival data from the Dark Energy Survey at the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. It was first serendipitously observed back in November 2010. Back then it was still a whopping 4.8 billion kilometres away from the Sun, which would place it roughly at the distance of the orbit of Neptune. Since then, it's been intensively studied by both ground and space-based telescopes. The study's lead author, Manta Hoy from Macau University, describes it as an amazing object given how active it is, despite it still being so far away from the Sun. He says the challenge in measuring this comet has been how to discriminate the solid nucleus from the huge dusty coma that's enveloping it. The comet's currently still too far away for its nucleus to be visually resolved by Hubble. Instead, Hubble data is showing a bright spike of light at the nucleus's location. So the authors made a computer model of the surrounding coma and adjusted it to fit the Hubble image. Then the glow of the coma was subtracted, which left behind a star-like nucleus. The authors then compared the brightness of the nucleus to earlier radio observations using ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array Telescope in Chile. And this combined data constrained the diameter and reflectivity of the nucleus. The new Hubble measurements are close to the earlier size estimates from ALMA but convincingly suggest a much darker nucleus surface than previously thought. In other words, it's big and blacker than coal. The comet's already been falling towards the Sun for well over a million years. It's coming from the long hypothesized region containing thousands if not millions of comets called the Oort Cloud. A diffuse cloud of icy debris, frozen worlds and comets thought to have an inner edge at roughly 2,000 to 5,000 times the distance between the Sun and the Earth. As for its outer edge, well, that could extend as far as a light year. The Oort Cloud's comets didn't actually form so far out from the Sun. Instead, they were ejected billions of years ago, quite literally flung out by gravitational interactions with the outer planets when the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn were still evolving. These far-flung bodies only travel back towards the Sun, planets and inner solar system if their distinct orbits are disturbed by the gravitational tug of a passing star. Think of it as shaking apples out of a tree. 
Comet Bernardinelli Bernstein follows a 3 million year long elliptical orbit, taking it as far from the Sun as roughly half a light year. Right now, the comet's around 3 billion kilometres from the Sun and falling perpendicular to the plane of our solar system. Now, at that distance, things are cold. Temperatures on the comet would be around minus 211 degrees Celsius. Yet there's a coma, which means the chemical that's doing the sublimation must be carbon monoxide, because it can sublimate off the surface to produce a dusty coma at those sort of temperatures. Comet Bernardinelli Bernstein is providing astronomers with an invaluable clue about the size distribution of comets in the Oort cloud and hence the cloud's total mass. Estimates for the Oort cloud's mass vary widely, reaching as high as 20 times the mass of the Earth. First hypothesized back in 1950 by the Dutch astronomer Jan Oort, the Oort cloud, or more correctly Oort cloud, still remains a theory because the innumerable comets that make it up are too faint and too distant to be directly observed. After all, we could simply be talking about interstellar objects that have been caught up in the Sun's gravitational field and are simply falling towards the Sun because of that. But if the Oort cloud is real, it means the Sun's largest structure is, well, really all but invisible. It's estimated that NASA's pair of Voyager spacecraft won't even reach the inner realms of the Oort cloud for another 300 years, and they could take as long as 30,000 years to pass through it. The simple fact is, circumstantial evidence coming from infalling comets is all we have, because that's all we can do to trace back where these comets are coming from, and hence where the likely Oort cloud is. And it's not like a Kuiper Belt-type ring. These comets approach the Sun from all different directions. That means the Oort cloud isn't a ring, but spherical in shape. The comets are deep free samples of the composition of the early solar system, preserved for billions of years. The reality of an Oort cloud is bolstered by theoretical modelling of the formation and evolution of the solar system. The more observational evidence that can be gathered through deep sky surveys, coupled with multi-wavelength observations, the better astronomers will understand the Oort cloud's role in our solar system's evolution. This is Space Time. Still to come, detection of the most distant galactic laser. And China has launched its 182nd spy satellite since 2016. And really, you've got to ask yourself, why do they need so many? All that and more coming up on Space Time. Astronomers have discovered a massive laser called a megamaser generated by the collision of two galaxies. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, show that this powerful radio wave laser was actually produced some 5 billion light years away. The maser was generated when hydroxyl molecules, which are composed of one atom of hydrogen and one of oxygen, absorbed photons at a specific wavelength of 18 centimetres. They then emit two photons of the same wavelength. And when molecular gas gets extremely dense, as typically happens when two galaxies collide, the emission gets very bright and can cause concentrated beams of light to shoot out. And this can be seen at radio frequencies more than a third of the way across the universe. What's actually causing the photons to shoot out as a focus beam is still a mystery. The Megamaser was detected by astronomers looking at data from the Meerkat radio telescope in South Africa. The study's lead author, Dr. Marcin Glowacki, who was with the University of Western Cape in South Africa when he made the discovery, and he's now at the Curtin University node of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research in Western Australia, says the light from the Maser has travelled some 58,000 billion billion kilometres to reach the Earth. Now that's 58, followed by 21 zeros. He says it's the first hydroxyl megamaser of its kind to be observed by Meerkat and the most distant ever seen by any telescope. Just as impressive is the fact that this record-breaking discovery was made with just a single night of observations by Meerkat, which is undertaking a deep sky survey involving more than 3,000 hours of observations. Meerkat is one of the precursor instruments to the Square Kilometre Array project, which is constructing the world's biggest radio telescope. 
So huge it'll cover two continents, South Africa and Australia. The authors are using Meerkat to observe narrow regions of the sky in extremely deep detail, measuring atomic hydrogen in galaxies from the distant past right through to now. The combination of studying hydroxyl mazes and hydrogen will help astronomers better understand how the universe has evolved over time. The record-breaking maser has been named Nunkalkuta, an Izizulu word meaning Big Boss. Glowacki says intensive follow-up observations of this new find are now being planned. So a maser is a laser, but as a laser is seen in the visible light or maybe infrared, masers have longer wavelengths, so they're seen in microwaves or radio waves. These are often associated with uh, water clouds in galaxies. Yes, they are water mega masers. In this particular case, we're talking about hydroxyl molecules, so one atom hydrogen and one atom oxygen. And this is the molecule that created this particular maser or mega maser. What differentiates a mega maser from a maser? That's a sense of scale, basically. It's larger. And what powers these masers? They can be extremely powerful on a galactic scale. So in this case, these Hydroxyl molecules come from a merger of two different galaxies. So you have two galaxies that collide and form a larger one, and this can create a lot of dense gas. And it's this large amount of gas that will power the maser. So the molecules will absorb photons of 18 centimeter wavelength and give off two photons. So when you have a large amount of gas, this will become extremely bright. And it doesn't just go everywhere it focuses. Correct. Are these at all related to quasars in any way? Is there a supermassive black hole involved in these things? Not necessarily, no. Okay. These are more just from the large amount of gas that is occurs when two galaxies merge and all the gas clouds will condense and create denser gas. What causes the focusing? That's something we still need to understand further. Are there any leading theories at all? I, I suppose it depends on the scenario. Some say that it's possible that some mega masers are also due to the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. We don't believe that's the case for this particular galaxy based on the information we have, but those are known to have focused beams on either side of the supermassive black hole, but this is an ongoing area of research. Tell me about this discovery. Yes, I'll take you back to 2020. This was when COVID started, and I was currently working in South Africa at the time, and we had a very harsh lockdown, so I actually made this discovery from my home, from my dining table. I was looking through data from a first night of observation for a project with the Meerkat radio telescope. I was doing data verification just to make sure that this first night of observation was looking like we expected to have the same amount of noise levels. And this requires looking through all parts of the data to investigate this. And when I was looking for the data, I noticed the bright blob of emission that I didn't expect to see from the first night because it was fairly distant. So we looked at the second night of observation soon after, and we saw the same emission in the same part of the sky and the same frequency. And by doing follow-up investigations, looking into the literature, we could confirm that this emission was due to a mega maser. So as I mentioned before, mega masers occur in galaxies that have just merged. And these are interesting parts of galaxies to understand as astronomers, because we need to understand how galaxies have evolved in time, how they've grown from these mergers and so forth. But you need to understand not just how they're merging now, but also in the distant past. So until now, there was only about a hundred of this kind of mega masers detected, and they had all been relatively nearby. So in the first night of observation for this project from this new telescope, we've been able to make the first really distant discovery of a mega maser about 5 billion light years away. And so this is very encouraging news that we'll be able to further detect such mega masers in the distant past and help our understanding of galaxy evolution. The name of the mega maser and where that came from? So the name is, or nickname is Nikola Kaffa which is, an, is a Zulu word, and it translates to big boss. There was a competition set up by the project that this discovery was made in for the general public to send in suggestions for nicknames, and a student studying at the university came up with this suggestion. Where does this research go now? So we have some follow-up observations planned for this particular mega maser so we can better understand what's happening in the host galaxy. And in the meantime, this survey is going to continue. It's called the LADUMA project, which stands for looking at the distant universe with the Meerkat array. Primarily, it's focused for looking at neutral hydrogen gas, which is another gas that starts in form form in galaxies. But as it's shown, it can also detect mega masers. And it's going to do this by looking at the distant past, by spending over 3,000 hours 
with the Meerkat telescope looking at one patch of the sky. So we'll be getting fantastic sensitivity. And since we made this discovery in one night and we plan to use it for 3,000 hours, it's quite encouraging already. That's Dr. Marcin Glowacki from the Curtin University node of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. And this is Space Time. Still to come... China launches its 182nd spy satellite since 2016, and later in the science report, the discovery of patterns of electrical activity in fungi which appear to resemble human speech. Think about that next time you're cooking up some mushrooms. All that and more still to come on Space Time. China has launched what it euphemistically likes to call a new Earth observation satellite. The Gaofang 303 was launched aboard a Long March 4C rocket from the Zhuquan Satellite Launch Center in northwestern China. Beijing claims the new spacecraft will aid in marine disaster prevention and mitigation work, dynamic marine environment monitoring, marine research, environmental protection, water conservancy, agriculture, forestry monitoring, urban planning and meteorological scientific research. In reality, Gaofang 303 is a People's Liberation Army military surveillance and reconnaissance spy satellite. The 2,800-kilogram spacecraft is based on a CSL-3000B bus and is equipped with a synthetic aperture radar, control moment gyros and a data communication transmission network hub. The satellite has an image resolution of better than a metre and carries enough fuel for an eight-year lifespan. The new spacecraft will now be networked with other Gaofang satellites as Beijing continues to undertake what it describes as preparations for war, a path it's getting more and more confident with as it continues to monitor the West's response to Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. Beijing has a constellation of 485 satellites currently orbiting the Earth. Since 2016, Beijing's launched more than 182 Earth observation, surveillance and reconnaissance satellites. These are designed to provide near-continuous high-resolution and electronic monitoring of areas of interest to China, and they include at least 36 Gaofeng and some 89 Yao Gang spy satellites. This launch also marks the 414th mission for the Long March series of rockets. It's been a busy time for China's rocket launch industry. A new Long March 6A rocket recently undertook its maiden flight successfully, placing two new satellites into orbit. The Long March 6A is a new 50-metre-tall medium-lift rocket equipped with two 120-ton thrust engines burning liquid oxygen and kerosene as well as four strap-on solid rocket boosters. It's far larger than the smaller, lighter but similarly named Long March 6 rocket, which is built by the same company. The launch from the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in Jiangxi Province carried the Pujang-2 and Tiankun-2 spacecraft into their respective orbits. Beijing describes the Pujang-2 as an Earth observation satellite tasked with carrying out scientific tests and surveying land resources, monitoring population density, as well as weather, traffic and crop growth. And that's still a Chinese word salad for spy satellite. It's been placed into a 605-kilometre high polar orbit. Also on the flight was the Tiankun-2 spacecraft, which is a follow-up to the earlier Tiankun-1, launched in 2017. It's a technology testbed designed to verify satellite bus design, artificial intelligence capabilities, new multitasking algorithms, optical camera systems, different types of in-orbit attitude control systems, multifunctional flexible cladding materials, and to ensure that a new designed flexible solar array system works. The day following the Long March 6A launch, Beijing launched a Long March 11 rocket from the Zhaiquan Satellite Launch Center. The mission deployed three Tiangpeng-2 satellites into orbit. Now, Beijing are keeping details of these satellites quiet, only saying that they'll provide atmospheric measurements from space, survey space environment and correct orbital projection models. Read into that what you will. Meanwhile, 
China's Tianzhou 2 cargo ship has burnt up during atmospheric re-entry, with larger debris segments crashing down as planned into the southeastern Pacific Ocean. The Tianzhou 2 was launched back in May last year on a Long March 7 rocket from the Wengchang Satellite Lord Centre in Henan Province, carrying 6.8 tonnes of supplies for China's Tiangong Orbital Space Station. The payload included two tons of propellant and more than 160 packages of supplies, as well as two extravehicular activity spacesuits for Takenots to perform spacewalks. The space station's existing Shenzhou 13 three-person crew will be returning to Earth this week following their six-month stay on station. They'll be handing over the orbiting outpost to the new Shenzhou 14 crew. This is Space Time. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 